Hello, and welcome to LGBTQ Victory Institute's 36th Annual International LGBTQ Leaders Conference. We're so glad you're joining us for what will be a unique but exciting three days of plenaries, breakout sessions, and networking. Thank you to all our sponsors, including our presenting sponsors, Comcast, Facebook, and Toyota. It's only because of you that we were able to provide complimentary registration for this year's event. You know, nearly four decades ago, this conference began in a small hotel conference room with just a dozen LGBTQ elected officials serving in city and county level offices. It was more support group than conference, as now U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin often says. What progress we've made. Now there are over 860 LGBTQ elected officials serving in the United States, from the U.S. Congress to mayors of major cities. Around the world, more out LGBTQ people are serving in parliaments and in executive office than ever before. And we're fortunate to have hundreds of these elected officials join us over the next few days to share their wisdom and to socialize with us. We may be virtual, but the work to move equality forward does not stop for a pandemic. And as this election year proved, we refuse to slow down. This unprecedented year led to unprecedented victories for LGBTQ candidates in the United States with more than 1,000 out LGBTQ people running and more than 340 winning elected office, many for the first time. We elected more LGBTQ members of the U.S. House than ever before, including Richie Torres and Mondaire Jones, who will become the first out black members of Congress. We nearly doubled the number of trans state legislators from four to seven, with Sarah McBride becoming the first out trans state senator and Stephanie Byers the first out trans state legislator of color. We elected Todd Gloria, mayor of San Diego, making him the first LGBTQ person and the first person of color elected to run the city. We elected our first non-binary state legislator, Maury Turner, and in Oklahoma, Oklahoma of all places, and America elected Joe Biden as president. Joe Biden, who is working with our presidential appointments initiative to build the most LGBTQ inclusive administration in U.S. history. And the rainbow wave extended well beyond the United States. In Guatemala, Aldo Davila took his seat as the nation's first out congressman. In France, voters elected Marie Cao, the first trans mayor in the country. And in Brazil, Erica Hilton became the first black and first out trans woman elected city councilor in Sao Paulo. Yet we're not celebrating achieving these milestones for milestones sake. LGBTQ leaders are making enormous contributions in this difficult year. We are leading in confronting the pandemic, leading in demanding police reform, and leading in fighting to end white supremacy, leading in ensuring LGBTQ rights are respected. Pennsylvania Secretary of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine, is the leading voice in tackling the pandemic in her state. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot led in sounding the alarm on the pandemic's racial disparities. Minneapolis City Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins' words symbolized national grief and outrage when she said George Floyd's murder felt like a knee on the neck of black America. And, Major, and Mayor Claudio Lopez of Bogota, Colombia fought the pandemic in her city while creating the Department of Sexual Diversity. 2020 showcased the power and impact of LGBTQ leadership on communities, movements, and countries. And the rainbow wave of newly elected LGBTQ leaders ready to take office will expand that influence and impact. Yet there are some dark clouds on the horizon. With our growing visibility has come an increasing number of homophobic and transphobic attacks on LGBTQ candidates and elected and appointed officials. They're more frequent and more blatant than we've seen in years. LGBTQ leaders have been called sexual predators and drug users. They've been misgendered and their dead names, dead names used. They've been called deplorable and threatened with violence and even death. Their dating histories and use of dating apps have been weaponized. The attacks are coming in many forms, from political opponents, million dollar TV ad buys, and right wing media stories. Attacks from hate groups like QAnon who concentrate their rabidity on LGBTQ leaders through social media, bombarding them with hundreds of threatening messages, 
that ridicule their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Some of these efforts are clumsy. Others have derailed entire campaigns. But what is perhaps most concerning is the chilling effect it has on LGBTQ people who want to run for office. And even those leaders already in a government role, government role who might want to step up. A recent Victory Institute survey showed many LGBTQ people are hesitant to run for office because they fear anti-LGBTQ attacks, both for themselves and for their families. They fear for their family safety. Some already in office cite a similar concern. Not sure they want to run for higher level positions because of it. And young LGBTQ people who grew up online fear that an old text or photo could be used to humiliate them publicly if they ran. The efforts to undermine LGBTQ leaders is a warning shot, a reminder that our increased representation is not inevitable. And it is up to us to continue to grow the pipeline and ensure a new rainbow wave emerges in 2021, 2022, and beyond. Each of us, each one of us, needs to encourage more LGBTQ people to pursue a career in public service. We know people need to be asked multiple times. Let's ask. Each of us needs to remind LGBTQ people of the importance of our voice in the halls of power. It isn't always as obvious as we think. Each of us needs to take time to mentor LGBTQ people who are close to running or who want an appointed position. Fear of the process is often the biggest deterrent. And each of us must fight when any of us faces unfair attacks. We act tough, but homophobia and transphobia remain poisonous. Text messages, phone calls, tweets of support, they can be the boost needed at a difficult time. Let's step up for each other. This network is the cause of the rainbow waves and it is what will ensure they keep coming. Next year, we'll have more LGBTQ people in elective office than ever before, at every level. We expect more LGBTQ people appointed to US government positions than ever before. And in both, we will have more diverse LGBTQ leaders than ever before. It is a true bright spot in a year where there were few, frankly. So congratulations to those of you newly elected in 2020. Welcome back to the elected leaders, appointed leaders, advocates, and allies who are joining us again this year. You're the reason LGBTQ political power is strong and growing. We can't stop. Now, I am excited to welcome U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin, the first openly LGBTQ person ever elected to the U.S. Senate, but also a great friend of Victory and a friend of mine. Welcome, Senator Baldwin, for the presentation of the 2020 Tammy Baldwin Breakthrough Award. And everyone, have a great conference. Good afternoon, everyone. Every year, the LGBTQ Victory Institute honors an up-and-coming LGBTQ elected official with this award, recognizing their public service in moving our march for equality and justice forward. I want to acknowledge and congratulate every individual who was nominated for this year's honor. Thousands of Victory supporters nominate and vote for the elected officials who most inspire our community. Your work at the local and state level is more important than ever, as we will soon have a president once again who is committed to progress for our community. I take great pride in recognizing this year's award recipient. Today, I am so incredibly honored to present the 2020 Tammy Baldwin Breakthrough Award to Pennsylvania State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta. You know, I often say that I didn't run to make history, I ran to make a difference. And that is the same inspiration that has driven Malcolm's public service in the Pennsylvania State Legislature. First elected in 2018, Malcolm joined Representative Brian Sims as Pennsylvania's second openly LGBTQ state legislator. And at 30, Malcolm is one of the country's youngest LGBTQ state lawmakers. Recently, Malcolm provided real leadership 
in standing up for voting rights as Pennsylvania Republicans sought to ram through controversial proposals that would intimidate lawful voters and undermine the credibility of the electoral process. Malcolm fought against these last-minute voter suppression tactics head-on to ensure every Pennsylvania voter could make their voices heard at the ballot box. And as a legislator, Malcolm serves as a conscious within the Democratic caucus, frequently speaking with moral clarity against unsafe working conditions, gun violence, and discrimination against the LGBTQ community. Malcolm, you ran to make a difference in people's lives, and you're doing just that. You're an inspiration to me and an inspiration to so many in the LGBTQ community across the country. Congratulations on this well-deserved honor. Thank you to the Victory Institute for all you do, and have a great conference. I want to start today with what I consider the most important phrase in the English language and any other language for that matter. Thank you. Seriously, thank you. To the entire Victory family, to Mayor Parker, Ruben, and the whole team at Victory Fund and Victory Institute, I'm deeply honored to receive the Tammy Baldwin Breakthrough Award. But I think it's always more than an honor, frankly, to be in a category with people who not only inspire you, but with many folks who are actually my friends. To Senator-elect McBride, not only did she make history, but she continues to make our community better, <laughs> making clear what elections are all about, about each and every one of us and about our families. To my friend, Representative Harrod, she answers the phone at any time of the night, any day, any time of the day or night to cheer me on and to really be a shoulder. She is a legislator's legislator and I'm deeply honored to call her a friend. To Rep. Elect Turner and Rep. Chavez, we have not gotten to know each other well yet, but you are a perfect example of what it means to lead with your whole self exactly as you are and the value that has in our electoral process and in the legislature. And as we think about what happened this year with the 2020 wave, I think one thing is crystal clear. Now is the time to celebrate our victories, but to also double down on what made us victorious in the first place. Victory has a tried and true model that works. When we recruit candidates, train candidates, and then make sure they have all the resources to be successful, those candidates can win. But as Mayor Parker said, it's not enough to make history for history's sake. If you're a student of American history, one thing is crystal clear, that folks on the margins have always moved America closer to its moral core. That's the power of victory candidates winning for state rep and for mayor and for senator and for one day president of the United States. That's the impact of it. When queer candidates run and win, then we will truly be able to address the climate crisis. When victory candidates run and win, that's when we'll be able to do something about criminal justice reform and systematic racism and oppression. When victory candidates win, it provides an opportunity for us to fight for health care that includes everybody, including our trans and non-binary brothers and sisters. When victory candidates win, it makes America better. And so our question is, what do we do now? The answer to that is fundamentally clear. We double down. We triple down. We invest in young and bold candidates who are not only going to win historic elections, but they are going to call America to not just be a place where we talk about equality and equity, but a place where we can live it in our lifetime. That is our mission. 
That is what the 2020 wave shows us. That is what we can do in 2021 and 2022 if we all across this country inspire, engage, and support young queer folks who run for candidates. For all, these are the types of candidates that are going to make the future of our country brighter. We saw it this year, but I will end with this note. Senator Baldwin, Senator Sem Semina, Congressman Jones, Congressman Perez, these folks can't do it by themselves. They need backup. We need to send them some backup. We know that this was an historic year, and I'm excited for what, what all the years ahead are going to have in store. So with that, I'd like to take a little look back before we get to our opening plenary to look at this year's rainbow wave where over a thousand candidates all across the country ran gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, queer, young, old, stepped up to run for office, and so many of them won. So let's watch this video and get to our first conversation. Thank you, Victory. I'm Richie Torres, and I am the representative elect for the 15th Congressional District, and I am the first Afro-Latinx LGBTQ member of the United States Congress. I'm San Diego Mayor-elect Todd Gloria, the first out LGBTQ person and the first person of color elected mayor of America's eighth largest city. I'm Georgia State Senator-elect Kim Jackson, and I am the first LGBTQ person ever elected to the Georgia State Senate. I am Vermont State Representative-elect Taylor Small, and I am the first out trans person to serve in the Vermont State Legislature. I'm Pennsylvania State Representative-elect Jessica Benham, and I'm the first out LGBTQ woman and the first openly autistic person elected to Pennsylvania State Legislature. Hi, I'm New York State Senator-elect Jabari Brisport, and I am the first out LGBTQ person of color elected to the New York State Legislature ever. I am Alicia Musso. I am the Vice President-elect of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. I am the first open LGBTQ executive official elected in the Oglala Sioux Tribe. I'm Delaware State Senator-elect Sarah McBride, and I'm the first out transgender person ever elected to a state senate in the United States. I'm Florida State Senator Chevron Jones, and I'm the first out LGBTQ person elected to the Florida Senate. I'm Councilmember Rosemary Ketchum, and I'm the first out trans person ever elected in West Virginia history. I am Eagle Pass City Council Member Elias Diaz, and I made history by becoming the first LGBTQ elected official in Eagle Pass, Texas. Hello to all my friends at Victory Fund. I am Kristen Graziano. I am the sheriff elect for Charleston County, South Carolina. I am the first openly LGBTQ person to win in this state for the Office of Sheriff. But in addition to that, I'm the first woman ever elected to the Office of Sheriff in the state of South Carolina. So I think it's safe to say we made her street. This one's for all the girls. I am Rhode Island State Senator-elect Tiara Mack, and I'm the first black out LGBTQ plus person ever elected to the Rhode Island State Senate. I'm Sheriff-elect Charmaine McGuffey in Hamilton County, Ohio, and I am the first woman and the first out LGBTQ person to be elected in this county as Sheriff. Aloha, I'm State Representative Adrian Tam, and I'm the only out LGBTQ plus member of the Hawaii State Legislature. Hit it! <laughs> Hi, I'm Wow, welcome. Um, it is incredible to see uh, all of the folks representing the LGBTQ plus community across the country at all levels of government. Um, this year, 2020 was amazing in terms of LGBTQ wins. Um, there was a 41% increase in LGBTQ candidates from two years, 2018 to 2020. Uh, in today's Rainbow Wave plenary, we're going to be talking about some of those candidates who had historic wins and talking to them. Uh, and before we do that, we're going to have a quick word from our sponsor, Comcast. Um, so take it away, Comcast. Good afternoon. 
I'm Clayton Fennell, Senior Vice President of Local Government Affairs and Principal for LGBTQ External Affairs for Comcast, which includes Comcast Cable, NBC Universal, Telemundo, and Sky. On behalf of Comcast, I'm proud and excited to welcome you to Victory's International Leaders Conference. And on a personal level, allow me to honor your noble commitment to ensure that our diverse voices and perspectives have a place at the table as you run for elected office, seek political appointments, and take your place in shaping inclusive policy and legislation. Your authentic, visible servant leadership is incredibly impactful now and for generations to come. As each of you work to govern, lead, and drive progress in these unprecedented times, please know Comcast stands ready to be a focused partner and resource for you. In particular, we know that COVID-19, structural racism, systematic bias, and racial violence have had a tremendous impact on nearly every aspect of our daily lives. Across Comcast, we have mobilized for sustainable action. In response to COVID-19, we're working 24-7 to ensure that our broadband network is able to provide the capacity folks need as they learn, work, and conduct life remotely. We're continuing and deepening our commitment to digital inclusion through our Internet Essentials Program, the nation's largest and most comprehensive broadband adoption program for low-income people. And we're increasing access to news and information as well as free educational resources. We're also developing a comprehensive multi-year plan to fight injustice and inequality against any race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, or ability. This plan includes putting the full weight of our company's media resources behind educating our viewers on diverse and inclusive cultures, perspectives, and experiences by making anti-racism education and inequality awareness a priority. We're committing funds and resources to help small businesses, particularly those owned by people of color that have been affected by extended closures in the wake of COVID-19. And we're partnering with and providing $75 million in cash support to organizations working to eradicate justice, injustice and equality. So as you work to move the needle through your governing, legislative, and policy efforts, please know that Comcast, NBC, Universal, Telemundo, and Sky are ready to continue partnering with you as an education, awareness, thought, and technology leader. Please have a great conference. Thank you so much for that, and thank you all so much for for joining us, I'm Kate Sawson. I am a reporter, the LGBTQ plus reporter at the 19th, and I'm so delighted to be with you today. We have an incredible panel lined up for you today. We have with us Assembly Member uh, Todd Gloria, who is now the mayor elect of the city of San Diego. Um, Kim Jackson, who's Senator elect um, of the Georgia State Senate. And Sarah McBride, uh, Senator-elect of the Delaware State Senate, um, someone that I've known for for a good minute. And um, I, I'm so excited to talk with all of you. I want to um, get your whole bios. And I just I just want you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, where you all come from and how you got here, because it's going to be such an important year in terms of state legislatures and cities, especially with the Supreme Court where we have it. Um, so can you just give me a little bit of, of a breakdown? You know, who are you? What's your story? Give us the, the elevator pitch. Um, Senator-elect um, Sarah McBride, let's start with you. Well, thank you so much, Kate. It's so wonderful to see you. It's great to be on this uh, panel with Senator-elect Jackson and Mayor-elect Gloria two incredible, incredible leaders. Um, I just want to say a, a special shout out to Malcolm Kenyatta, Representative Malcolm Kenyatta, a dear friend of mine who I've known for, for years. I can't think of a better honoree for this year's Tammy Baldwin Breakthrough Award. And, and watching that video of everyone who, who, who won this election cycle was really exciting and inspiring to see. Um, as you mentioned, I am a recently elected member of the Delaware State Senate representing the fighting first in Delaware, our first state. Um, it's a, a district that includes parts of the city of Wilmington uh, and the communities of Claymont and Belfont. I grew up here in this district. Um, in many ways, the communities throughout this district helped shape me into the person that I am and certainly helped support me and sustain me through some of the most difficult challenges in my own life. From coming out to fighting for my rights here in Delaware, 
to a personal tragedy uh, of losing my husband to cancer. And I've seen this community at its best. I've seen us live up to our values of kindness and respect and care for one another. But I ended up deciding to run for office because fighting for equality here in Delaware, living here and knowing these communities, I know that that we have a long way to go before our state more fully lives up to what I like to call our, our state of neighbors and the values at the heart of this small state. Um, I also decided to run because having fought for non-discrimination protections here in Delaware, having worked at the human rights campaign, I saw that state legislatures, local and state government, um, are the places where the rubber meets the road on public policy and where you can make the most amount of change for the most number of people in the most number of ways in your communities. And I also saw for, for all the toxicity and negativity at the federal level, that state legislatures are uniquely positioned to be laboratories of democracy for big ideas that meet the scope and the scale of the challenges we face. And so I threw my hat in the ring and I did so having started my journey as an out trans person working at Victory Fund and seeing very clearly that my voice could matter. Well, it's so exciting to have you there. I will say that I'll miss calling you at the human rights campaign, <laughs> but excited to to call you call as, a, as a state senator, um, Senator Elect uh, Jackson. Um, tell us a little bit about how how you ended up um, as a Georgia state senator. <laughs> Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is such a wonderful panel of folks to be with. Uh, I'll, I'll start by just saying, you know, I grew up in a small town in Cowpens, South Carolina, a literally a one stop light town. And when I was a little girl, I told my I told my pastor that I wanted to be a pastor when I grow up. And he looked at me and he said, you know, girls can't do that. And I looked around my entire community and there were no women who were serving as pastors or priests in any capacity. And so I believed them until I went to college when my college chaplain saw gifts in me and said, I think that you're called to ministry and I wanna show you something. And so he put me in his car and he drove me around Greenville, South Carolina and he introduced me one by one to women who were serving in ministry, to women who were working as pastors. He let me see what was possible. So when I think about my historic win, that's, I hope I am that for someone else, for that little queer kid, particularly those little queer people of color who live in the South, I hope that they can see that this is possible, uh, that they can dream big dreams in order to be able to affect positive change in their state, in our country. So I ran as an out person because I felt like it was important to run as my authentic self, all of me, my black self with lesbians and, and goats and chickens and all that I am, <laughs> because that matters. People need authentic folks. And most of all, I ran because the same exact reason why I serve as a pastor, because I love people. And I believe that every Georgia citizen has a right to be able to have access to health care, to quality education, to clean water and clean air. And so I ran for those reasons and I look forward to serving in the Senate to work towards that for the betterment of all Georgians. That's lovely. I, I love the image of you with, with your goats and I hope you actually do have yeah. do have them. <laughs> um, Mayor-elect uh, Gloria, um, Tell us um, a little bit about your journey here. You know, I followed you in the assembly in California for some time now, um, but this is this is really historic. Your win. Um, tell us uh, a little bit about how you're feeling right now, and and um, you know, we've been watching California. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of a scary place to be um, in terms of COVID, but um, for LGBTQ equality, it's been such a big couple of years um, here. So I, I really want to talk about the climate in terms of LGBTQ rights and, and, and what your win means. Well, thanks for that, Kate. And uh, 
thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to hang out with Ken and with Sarah uh, to celebrate. Um, while we'd love to do it in person, uh, this is also a great way to hopefully reach more people uh, who really need to hear stories like ours to understand uh, that they too can serve. Um, and I, that's kind of probably the most important thing I would like to share today. Um, and Kate, you're right. I am fortunate to be able to live in California where we have long held a leadership position when it comes to equality. But as my election of my hometown shows, there's still uh, barriers to be broken um, and work to be done. And um, I would just share that I'm the proud son of a hotel maid and a gardener. Uh, two people who raised my brother and I to believe that if you care about something, you're supposed to leave it better than you found it. Uh, the way that played out when I was a kid was that uh, in Southern California, we were often without a car uh, and we would often have to borrow someone's car uh, to get around. And when we do it, uh, they'd always make us, my brother and I wash the car and we'd fill it up with gas and gas even back then was expensive. Um, and it was always confusing to me that how, you know, a low income family was in the position of having to borrow people's cars, but we we're spending money on soap and, and uh, sponges and, and gas. And the answer was, was, you can't give it back the way we got it. You got to give it back the way better than you found it. Now they were not political people. In fact, I was the first person to register them to vote when I was a teenager, uh, but that was actually a recipe for public service. And I'll tell you that while I didn't see a lot of people like myself or like him or like Sarah uh, in public office, I was just drawn to it. I was that nerdy kid that would watch C-SPAN. I would read the newspaper uh, when I was eight and nine years old because I was just interested. And as soon as I could start volunteering on campaigns, I did. And I've spent my career serving my hometown and I just feel tremendously fortunate to just be able to wake up every day and serve uh, my hometown and try and do everything I can to make it better. Uh, and that's been in the city council, uh, in the state legislature, and now is the mayor of the eighth largest city in the country. And I just would ask all the viewers to kind of think about San Diego. Uh, we are a big city uh, right on the Pacific Rim. Uh, we share a border uh, with our partners uh, in Baja and Tijuana. Uh, and yet never in our city's history have we had a person of color, let alone an LGBTQ person to serve in the mayor's office. Uh, so this election, uh, Kate, as you mentioned, is historic. Uh, it does communicate, as Kim was mentioning, a message to young people in the city about what is possible if they're willing to work hard. And I look forward to being the first, but not the last uh, of someone like us in this role. You know, we're talking so much about firsts and, and I really just wanna, you know, sort of go back in time with each of you. You you all come from such different places and, and also you're different ages. Did you think, you know, growing up that you could be an out LGBTQ person and be elected? Was that a possibility in your mind? I'll, I'll just start by saying, uh, so I'm going to think about like me growing up when I, when I figured out that I was gay. So mm -hmm. like when I was, you know, 18 um, and no, I actually, I remember grieving um, that this hope that I had that one day I would get to run for elected office. I felt like it was dead the day that I um, decided to live my true self as, as a queer woman. And so this is, this is incredible. I, I've been telling my friends um, for much of my 20s, I spent a lot of time uh, grieving over my sexual orientation. And it was a, a great source of shame for my family, which is deeply religious. Um, and now I've moved into my 30s and I'm being celebrated around the nation for being for being me for being yeah. this out lesbian. And so that has been, it's been such a, a great joy to see that shift happen um, in my own development, but also across the nation. And, and again, I'm from the South. And so celebrating the fact that this could happen in the South, um, I think is just incredibly noteworthy. And so I, I couldn't dream of this, but I'm so glad that we're here. Yeah, I'll, I'll add it. It sounds like all three of us grew up as a, uh, as, as sort of political nerds and uh, loved watching, as, as Mayor, like Gloria said, C-SPAN. Um, I think we were probably the three people watching C-SPAN um, <laughs> at that point. And, you know, I think for me, the the idea that, that someone like me could get elected to public office was so impossible that it was almost incomprehensible. Um, and that's, I think, one of the, the most incredible things about being able to be part of this moment is I know that the message that 
Senator-elect Jackson and, and Mayor-elect Gloria's election and hopefully my election and, and so many others were able to send to a young person in our communities, but also elsewhere in this country who's struggling with how they fit into this world, LGBTQ or not, that our democracy can be big enough for them too, that their voice can matter and that they can live their truth and dream big dreams all at the same time. And while diversity is, in government is, is, is a necessity from a substantive standpoint, we know we can't craft policy solutions for a diverse community if the full diversity of that community is not represented at the table. We also can't scoff at the symbolic message, the symbolic nature of our, of our elections and the message the life-saving message that it can send to a young person who's just heard slurs around the dinner table or, or face down bullies at school. Um, I know how much of a difference that would have made for me as a kid growing up because like Senator-elect Jackson, when I came out, I, I had to come to terms with the fact that I may be giving up everything. I might be giving up my ability to, to find love, to live in a community that I love and to do what I love. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why our life experience is our superpower in, in this context. Because one, I think it's given us so many of the skills that that's necessary to run for office, but I also think voters see us and they recognize that all of us at some point in our life were willing to sacrifice our career, our job, our the ability to, 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 to pursue our dreams in order to do what was right. Mm. And if we've done that for identity, I think a lot of voters recognize that we have the perspective to do that on the issues that matter most to all of us. Um, and whether that's, as Senator Jackson said, healthcare or education or, or, or clean air and clean water, um, that we understand what's important. We understand that it's worth fighting for and that there are bigger, bigger, bigger challenges than us not winning an election. Yeah. Mayor Look Gloria, do you did you have a similar experience? Was there a, a moment for you where you were like, you know, maybe this is foreclosed for me? Absolutely. Um actually not only did I think that, I was told that. Um so that nerdy kid watching C SPAN uh took the first chance he had to get a uh intro to poli sci class. Uh and I showed up and the professor uh, I can remember it uh, vividly, uh, was giving a lecture about the two things you couldn't be if you wanted to be an elected official. And the first thing was gay. And the second thing, I can't tell you what it was because I was so stunned that someone would say that. Now, mind you, this was the early 90s, uh, so maybe that was a little more mainstream point of view. But in my heart of hearts, I kind of already believed that for the reasons uh, that the senators were sharing. Is you know every signal that we get as young people, as as young queer people, is that you don't get to live out your dreams. This this is not here for you, and that's why I appreciate Victory Fund actually making the doors a little wider for us, and for bringing us together in this opportunity. And for as busy as all of us are as elected officials, that I will always carve out time because I want to make sure that every kid that is getting that kind of signal that I got well up into that lecture, and then what I heard in that lecture, that I could push back. And I'll just maybe end with this: is to say that when I was sitting in that uh, classroom being told that, the only thing that kept me from being completely despondent about that was that we had already elected a woman named Christine Kehoe uh, here in San Diego. She's our Harvey Milk. She had been elected just the year before to our city council. And so while the professor said that, I knew he was wrong. Um, and uh, I, uh, so I absolutely got the signals that, that Kate and Sarah are talking about, uh, but that's precisely why we have to have convenings like this to make sure more people know that that's not true. Don't believe it. And if you're willing to work hard, and as they're saying, it's not so much about being uh, LGBTQ. Uh, I was elected because I'm the guy that said very clearly that I was going to do something about our housing affordability crisis in Southern California. Um, and so uh, I'm, I tell people, come for the gay, stay for the housing. Uh, because <laughs> in terms of the, the media attention that we're getting about this election, I'm happy to get that spotlight, but I want to use that spotlight and focus it on the issues that apply to everybody. Gay folks got to make the rent too, right? And uh, they need a mayor that's going to push for them on that. I think that was a part of why we were able to be successful in this campaign. So, and, and that's what I want to shift to next, which is 2020. Uh, obviously, we saw more LGBTQ people running than ever before. And that is a trend that has been happening. It seems like every cycle, we have more out candidates. What, what's going on? Why 
is it just the moment? Is it um, that it's easier to run as an LGBTQ person? I, I know, um, you know, Mayor like Gloria, you did not have an easy race. I know that to be an out trans person running sounds like quite a challenge. Um, why are more LGBTQ people running than ever before? Senator like McBride, do you want to start with this sure. one? You know, I, I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, I think one over the last several years, um, particularly during the Trump Pence administration, we've seen very clearly the old saying that if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. Um, that we have too long been the political pawns of the anti equality right wing, um, and that we have seen the power of diversity in government and changing the conversation. Um, you know, whether they say that that having three out members of a legislature fundamentally changes the policy outcomes. Delaware went from a state that had never elected an openly LGBTQ candidate to our state legislature this year to electing the magic number of three. And in a small state, that's a pretty, pretty big number. Um, I also think though that, and I was very mindful of this throughout the campaign, that, that the only reason why my candidacy was possible and the only reason why I received the reception I received during the campaign and then the results looked the way they looked was because of decades of work by generations of LGBTQ people who opened hearts and changed minds, who's, who have blazed trails, and who have ensured that we can all run. And for all the attention that does exist around our identities, when it comes to those conversations with voters, when it comes to the messages that voters are hearing, and when it comes to the election results, that voters are judging us based on our ideas and our experience and our passion on a whole host of issues, yes, including equality, but also including so many other issues um, that folks are struggling with, LGBTQ and straight and cisgender. Um, and that was only possible in my race and in all of the other races because of the work of the community and the movement over generations to open hearts and change minds. And then I think finally, we know as we've been talking about how, how, how one difficult it was to imagine someone like us in, in positions of power, but as Mayor Alec Gloria mentioned, the power that even one person can have as an example to demonstrate that your fears may be understandable, but perhaps unfounded, that the only limitation on our capacity to dream is our own imagination. And, you know, for me, seeing Danica Rome get elected in 2017 was a, a powerful, powerful example that trans candidates can run and they can win. Um, so I think for all those reasons and more, we've seen more and more LGBTQ people step up, run, and win. Senator-elect Jackson, um, you know, you are also a a first in your state. And I, was there a, did you have to weigh, you know, what this would look like for you when you were making the decision or, or was this just, you know, were you all in? <laughs> I mean, at some point you have to get all in in order to, yeah. right. Uh, but no, I mean, in the beginning, I, I was nervous. Um, so in Georgia, we've been blessed to have a significant number of already elected um, officials in the House side. And so I had some examples, um, but we didn't in the Senate. And uh, and I was worried. I'm, I'm also, I'm married to a Muslim. And so um that was a concern about um, about how that would go over with our constituents, but also just about her own desire to have some privacy and safety. You know, Mayor, Mayor Parker talked about this in her opening address. the The fears of anti LGBT or uh, attacks are those are powerful fears because it happens, and uh, and so it gave me pause. But I'm grateful to have a significant community who said, yes, you can do this. Um, and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to Victory Fund who trained me. I went to a lot of trainings, but I must say that the Victory Fund training was by far the best training that I could go to. And it gave me that last little boost that I needed to say, yes, I can do this. And I can do this as an out candidate who is unashamedly out, right? Um, and who can run on a platform that's broad. And so um, it, it did take me a little bit of time and some, some coaxing, um, but I'm incredibly grateful for all those first who came before me in different ways um, that certainly helped inspire me as well. 
And Mayor, like Gloria, I want to sort of ask you about this, which is, you know, obviously, along with all these historic firsts, we also saw this sort of unprecedented increase in anti-LGBTQ attacks. And I know that you experienced some of this. Um, what does it mean to run as an LGBTQ candidate? Uh, what does that look like? And for people who might be considering not running because of that, what do you say to them? Um, well, maybe for some context so that folks know what Kate is referring to. Uh, because California likes to be on the leading edge uh, of policy change, uh, we and I as a state legislator voted to support a bill uh, that equalized um, or removed some discriminatory language with regard to sexual orientation regarding our sex, sex offender registry. Um, penalties were harsher in California as well, they continue because the bill doesn't go into effect for a few more weeks, but um, uh, for gay and L LGBT folks than it is for straight folks. And we decided to take on that issue and we did and it passed by a single vote. And I woke up the next morning to see a headline on our local television station saying that Todd Gloria votes to support adults having sex with minors. And I think all of you understand the potency um, of that kind of an allegation, generally speaking, and how it's a bit stickier when you're talking about a gay man uh, for all the homophobic tropes that there have long been. And, you know, it definitely was a shock to the system. Uh, this, we were probably about eight weeks out from election day. Uh, mail was starting to appear uh, in folks' uh, mailboxes, and it was deeply concerning. Um, you know, we were able to overcome that, I think, solely for the fact, or maybe two things. Uh, one was that groups like Victory Fund, the Human Rights Campaign, Equality California, and others uh, swiftly came to my defense, uh, brought together a lot of voices to really push back and correct the record. To be very clear, California will still punish people uh, who uh, choose to uh, uh, harm a child, no questions. Um, but we won't treat them differently because of their sexual orientation. And so being able to clarify that was important. But Kate, the second piece of this that's important was that San Diegans knew me. Uh, they'd elected me for 12 years uh, in public office. And so I think they understood that what, what I was, how I was being described and who I am didn't match up. And uh, I guess to your question about what I would say to folks uh, who may consider running, First off, I'm all in. I say run. You know that. Uh, you know, not everyone's going to be successful, but there's there's importance and there's there's value in even running. Uh, but I think we have to go in eyes wide open and recognizing that we are more vulnerable to these kinds of allegations, uh, even in 2020. Uh, and you have to prepare yourself. And I appreciate what Kim was saying about her concern for her spouse. Um, you do have to consider what that means for your family members. I have a thick skin. I've been in politics a while. Um, it wasn't until I saw my parents after these uh, headlines were out there and what they were dealing with and how they internalized that, that I recognized how vicious an attack this was. Um, and all I can say is that, you know, about two months later, uh, I was able to defeat my opponent uh, by 12 points. Uh, and so it is proof that voters uh, will value the authenticity, as uh, I think Sarah and Kim were both saying, um, and just be true to yourself. But uh, it is still a difficult, it is more difficult, I think, for people of color. Uh, for women, uh, for queer people uh, to run, and there's no way to uh, to claim otherwise. Uh, but uh, I think that there, uh, it, it is proven that you can get past it, uh, and uh, and I, we certainly were able to do that with the grace of the people of San Diego. Senator Alec McBride, I you've been on both sides of this. I know because you've been a spokesperson for the Human Rights Campaign and then running a campaign. Um, what is it like to to um, you know? be a trans person running for office in this country in 2020? Well, you know, I think everything Mayor like Gloria just said really resonates. And, and during the course of, of the campaign, because of my previous work, specifically because I had read I Am Jazz to elementary school students, um, my opponent posted um, and, and put out messages that I uh, wanted to teach sex acts to kindergartners. Um, and so this, this sort of very clear anti-LGBTQ trope, it, it, it's still out there. And um, our opponents still seek to use it and, and try to capitalize on it. I think to Mayor-elect Gloria's point though, we're seeing that they are increasingly 
um, uh, uh, unpopular and 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 un non-resonant in in as messages. Um, you know, I'll say my gender identity never came up in conversations with voters. Um, on from my end and on their end, there were only a handful of instances where my gender identity came up. And I'll tell you, in those instances, a handful of them were genuine, good faith, earnest questions that people had about what it means to be trans. Um, and I can assure you, actually, because a number of them reached out to me afterwards to tell you that in all of those instances, those folks ended up voting for me. And they definitely didn't leave those conversations completely able to wrap their mind around the trans experience, but they ended up they ended up voting for me. I think they appreciated my vulnerability. They appreciated my willingness to engage and, and, and be patient with them. And they recognized that regardless of whether they could wrap around wrap their mind around my experience, they understood that I'd spent my life fighting for the underdog and I was going to go down to Dover to fight for every single underdog in this district. And then in the other instances, more frequently, the few instances where it came up, it was voters who were excited about the potential for more diversity in government. They were excited to send a message because at the end of the day, that message that we've talked about that have has been sent by our elections and so many other elections to, to young LGBTQ people, that wasn't a message sent by any one of us. It was sent by the voters of our districts and the voters of our cities, which is such an incredible thing as an elected official who's also an out LGBTQ person to know about the community that I'm privileged to represent. It makes me that much prouder to represent this community, to know how fair-minded people are here. But it's hard. You know, I knew there was going to be a lot of media attention on, on around my candidacy. And I knew that I wanted people to see me yes, as a trans candidate, but for all of the experiences and, 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 and ideas I bring to the table. And that was certainly a challenge that we had to very intentionally navigate as I campaigned, particularly when it comes to the media attention. Um, but, but we were able, I think, to successfully do that in large part because of the support and guidance of the Victory Fund. And I think to, to the points that have been made before, these are challenging. Um, experiences. Running for office is difficult and running as an out LGBTQ candidate creates extra barriers and burdens. Um, and I think so often people can look at our elections and say, well, they were able to do it for X, Y, or Z reason, but I can't do it. I, I hear the voice in my head. I feel the anxiety and the fear, and they must have done that. They must have not felt that, and they must have, have run for office without those kinds of fears and anxieties. And I think it's so important for us to demystify you know, our elections and ourselves and recognize that we ran for office in spite of having those fears and those anxieties and in spite of struggling with them throughout the campaign. We are human and 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 have those same concerns. We all, I think we, so many of us suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, and, and I think it's so important to reinforce for folks that you can have that voice in the back of your head that that questions whether you're whether you've got it, whether you're up for it, whether you can withstand the attacks. Um, but we also had the, those voices too, and we also struggled through that. And so, don't take that as a sign that you can't do it. That's a beautiful point. I think we all have imposter syndrome. We're all like, are we doing enough? We're not. Yeah. I don't know how I ended up here. I'm just hanging out. Um, but I know, you know, obviously you don't just run to make history, although you all have. Um, there's things that you're excited to work on, and and I'm, I really want to know what those are. I, I want to start with you, uh, Senator-elect Jackson. What are you most excited to do in this next year that we're hoping is at least marginally better than, than this, <laughs> this past year? Yeah, I mean, I have so so many things, uh, but the top of my mind is uh, around COVID-19 and uh, our states, you know, our states all kind of get to decide how we dispense the vaccine. And so I stand ready to really fight on behalf of those communities that have been most impacted, right? It's brown and black folks. Um, it's the people who live in my district who, who are the essential workers, who are driving the buses, who are still making sure that we have groceries to eat. And so I stand ready really to fight um, to make sure that they get to get to closer to the front line um, when it comes to receiving that vaccine. Um, so, and that's, so that's one of the things. And then um, another thing that I'm, I'm super excited to work on is, and this 
this, I'll work with other colleagues, is that we've been doing some very important work around access to PrEP um, in Georgia so that um, Georgians, I mean, and this is an issue that impacts the HIV, that impacts the, the LGBTQ community, and it also is an issue that significantly um, impacts African Americans in Georgia. And so, um, increasing access to PrEP is um, some work that's already started, and I just look forward to continuing to push that and to propel us even further to make sure um, that people are protected and that people receive the services that they need. Um, but there's so many issues. Uh, one, the last thing I'll say is. Um, I'm incredibly excited that we have a new president for a thousand reasons, um, but one that particularly impacts my district is that we are a refugee resettlement site. And so um, under the, the current administration, we haven't been able to, to welcome refugees into our city in the ways that we once did. And so we are looking forward to bringing more people in to re resettle here um, in our area and then to make sure that we have state laws that help give them a chance uh, to really thrive once they come and make these United States their home. So I'm really looking forward uh, to, to welcoming new, new people uh, to our nation and specifically to Georgia. That's cool. Um, and Mayor uh, Gloria, what's on your radar this year? Um, well, hold on. I, I agree with uh, Senator-elect Jackson in terms of the new president. Uh, as a mayor of a big city, uh, we need to have a president uh, who's willing to invest in stimulus, invest in infrastructure, uh, believe in science, all that good stuff. I got about 80 million reasons why I'm excited about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, and Kim, no pressure. We're certainly counting on Georgia to deliver uh, in these Senate races here soon. Um, Kate, to your question, um, you know, I, I shared at the beginning the story of my parents, uh, May and the gardener. Uh, you know, they didn't weren't well educated. Um, they worked extremely hard, and they were able to buy a home in San Diego, uh, put their two kids through college, the first in our family to ever go. Their story was possible in this city about 25, 30 years ago. But I think if anyone who's being honest knows that that story is nearly impossible today in a place as expensive as San Diego. So, okay, the top of my agenda is making sure that we continue to be a city that works for everybody. And maybe that's being LGBTQ, maybe that's being a guy of color. Uh, you know, my fierce desire to make sure that our city works for everybody. And in my view, it really starts with housing. Uh, it's sort of the basis of security. It's the basis of wealth building. And when we have literally thousands of people sleeping outdoors uh, any night uh, of the week in our city, uh, to what I think a lot about, the hundreds of thousands, not more than a million people in our uh, region uh, who are one rent away from becoming homeless themselves, or probably more defeating in a country that believes in opportunity, can't ever foresee being able to buy a home in this city. My focus is on the people who uh, earn, don't earn enough to get the luxury housing that we build a lot of here in Southern California, but who earn too much to qualify for any of the programs or assistance that we provide. We have to have a laser focus on the working and middle class for this city to work, because a city, a great city is not a place just for the very wealthy who can afford to live there and the very poor who are trapped here. We have to have a vibrant middle class. So. I hope to be the mayor that creates those pathways once again for hardworking people to live in a city like San Diego. Uh, and that's the top of my list uh, for San Diego in 2021. And Senator Alec McBride, um, what are you excited to get to work on? Well, from the start of this campaign, I, I said that I wanted to be the health care candidate and the paid leave candidate and the health care senator and the paid leave senator. Um, and I believe that we are obviously faced with significant challenges ahead of us. And I think that the incoming class of, of new legislators here in Delaware and, and elsewhere, the incoming elected officials that are either being returned or, or, or starting a new job come January, um, that we have a, a responsibility to ensure that we not only recover and rebuild from this crisis, but that we reimagine our world not a, as it was, but as it should and as it could be. That we learn the lessons of this moment and that we meet this crisis with meaningful action that makes a real difference in people's lives. I think one of the clear messages of this crisis is that it is an economic, moral, and public health necessity for every person to be able to get the care that they need. And so whether we're talking about making sure that, that more Delawareans are able to get health insurance and able to get the care or that no Del and that no Delawarean has to face the cruel and impossible choice that so many across the country have had to face during the COVID-19 between getting by and staying well, between 
their income and their job and their health. No one should have to give up their income in the face of illness. And so I am incredibly passionate about passing universal paid family and medical leave, joining the growing list of states, including places like California, that ensure that whether you're starting a family, whether you've been diagnosed with an illness, or whether you're caring for a loved one like I did with my husband through his battle with cancer, that you never, ever, ever have to choose between your health and your job, between your financial well-being and your physical well-being. Um, and I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the public is ready for it. The public's demanding it. I think a number of candidates here in Delaware won their elections in large part on the issue of paid family and medical leave, myself included. Um, but that our elected officials are ready for it, having seen the choices that so many in their communities have had to make, the impossible choices, having seen this crisis. And hopefully we have all learned the lesson from this moment. And I think, let me just say more broadly, I think one of the things that, that I can tell, I, I think all of us on this, in this conversation feel, both as young people who grew up watching politics and, and government, but also as young people, as, as young adults, who struggled with whether we could even dream of having a seat at the table, that these positions of public trust are a sacred responsibility. And forever, however long the voters choose to keep us in those positions, we have a responsibility to use those moments, that opportunity, that responsibility, that job, to create as much change for as many people as possible. That's why we struggled through all of this to, to, to win. That's why we persevered even when there weren't that many examples of people who were like us who were in office. And if it, it's on us to make sure that when we get there, we actually do something. Because all of the work that all of us have put in, that our community has put in to making sure that we have more diversity at the government, that's on us then to meet that commitment and that work with real results. I want to ask a little bit about that in terms of what's at stake for LGBTQ people right now. It's been such a strange um, and difficult last four years. Um, it seems like acceptance and embrace of LGBTQ people is at a place where it has never been. <laughs> um, more out LGBTQ candidates running than ever before, as we've talked extensively about. And then at the same time, the rollback of LGBTQ rights, um, the state of the Supreme Court is just been terrifying for a lot of people. Um, and it feels like there's just this constant contradiction and pull. And I'm curious where you all feel like things are at nationally, and then also in your states. And we've seen, you know, hundreds of anti-LGBTQ, anti-trans bills. And what you foresee um, in the next year in terms of state legislatures and, and in your states wait, where, where you think things are headed um, and, and what you're looking at in terms of these, these more local battles. I'll, I'll speak about this. Um, I'll, I'll speak on it actually on the, on the local, the local level for the state of Georgia. Um, and, and I'll just name, I'm, I'm very concerned um, about about our rights continuing to be limited. Um, in, in previous years, there's been legislation introduced that would prevent um, LGBT couples from being able to adopt children. Um, I foresee that coming back again. Uh, there also has often been um, introduced religious freedoms um, bills, which are not about religious freedom, but about um, freedom to be bigots. And uh, I foresee um, those, those things coming back as well. Um, you know, some people celebrate Georgia because we passed a, a comprehensive um, hate crimes bill that did um, give protections to LGBTQ people, and certainly we celebrate that. Um, but when we look into the future, our ability uh, to pass legislation that would provide additional protections, um, say through a, a comprehensive anti-discrimination um, bill, there's there's not an appetite for that on the on the other side of the aisle. And so um, I'm deeply concerned and also I am hopeful in, in other ways because um, we actually have the science, we have the research to back it up that when there are LGBTQ legislators sitting at the table, 
you get fewer and fewer of those anti-LGBT bills. And so now for the first time, Georgia will have a senator, which is where most of those terrible bills originate. Now they have an LGBTQ senator sitting at that table. And so while, while it does look kind of bleak, um, I actually am hopeful that uh, by having to just look at your colleague and say, I'm gonna make a bill that's gonna hurt you, um, people have a harder time doing that. And so I I'm hoping that my presence and, and ultimately, um, as somebody else said, you know, I'm the first, but I'm not gonna be the last. And I'm expecting some more folks to come um, just two years from now. And that, that'll make it much more difficult for these bad bills to get passed in Georgia. Well, you know, first off, I, I don't think it can be overstated just how important it was for us to elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris this past November, right? I, I think that particularly in light of the Bostock decision last June, this administration, this incoming administration has the opportunity to be the most pro-quality in American history and to make um, significant progress for the LGBTQ community, not just restoring the rights and protections of the Obama-Biden administration, but building on that and, and moving forward to ensure that our, our legal progress is met with true lived equality for LGBTQ people. Um, but on the flip side, the significance of now Justice Amy Coney Barrett cannot be overstated. Um, while we are going to have a presidential administration that has our backs, we're going to have an we're going to have a Supreme Court that is packed with anti-equality right-wing judges. Um, and, and and whether we're talking about issues of you know the corrupting of religious freedom, um, anti-trans legislation that's coming up, um, the ability of same-sex couples to to start and have families, um, but also issues like voting rights and health care. Um, our community has so much on the line with that, with that, with that body, and it reinforces the need for us to one win in Georgia, um, be able to pass the Equality Act because we'll have control of the the Senate schedule, um, but it also reinforces the importance of local and, and state governments that really need to serve as the safeguards of democracy. Um, that, that need to protect voting rights and expand voting rights, that need to, to protect our health care and expand people's ability to get the care they need. Um, it's going to be important for all of us at the local and state level to fight back against anti-LGBTQ bills if you're living in a state where that's a risk or in states like Delaware and California, move the ball forward um, to build on our progress to make sure that we're leaving no one in our community behind. Um, because right now is, is a moment of of significant potential, but also unbelievable risk for our community. And it's no coincidence um, that as the, the spotlight gets shined more on our community for both good reasons, but also because anti-equality politicians are seeking to, to utilize us as wedge issues, I think unsuccessfully, um, that we're gonna see discrimination and violence occur. Um, it's no coincidence that in the same year we had a rainbow wave, we also had um, the highest number of, of, of transgender people killed because that spotlight can be deadly if we don't meet that spotlight and that visibility with, with, with progress, if we don't adopt the kinds of policies that empower and lift people out of poverty, that ensure people have housing and health care. Um, that is going to be our responsibility as we move forward because our success and that visibility can create real risk for the most marginalized in our community. Okay, if I can just hop in here, I would just give uh, uh, the recommendation to look to California. Uh, as uh, when 2016 happened uh, and the Trump administration took over, we understood that what we were doing is to try and carry uh, the load and, and to create a blueprint for what the uh, rest of the nation could do uh, after this four-year hiatus of, of discrimination, of uh, mismanagement, of incompetence, of, of hate. Um, and so what we have been able to do is go beyond marriage equality and some of the sort of uh, mainline top of tier issues and really get down to the nitty gritty of talking about uh, our criminal justice system and the inequities that are there, the healthcare disparities that are in our community. So I, I would encourage folks, particularly legislators in other cities or candidates in other uh, states and uh, cities to look to what we have done over the last couple of years. And then my last request would be to consider that the 
relatively favorable position that we have found ourselves in, the progress that we have made comes with a responsibility to help those who have not achieved what we have achieved. And so you've seen our legislative LGBTQ caucus here in California stand up and speak out on behalf of our API caucus uh, when they were, uh, when API members of our community being demonized around the pandemic, speaking up on behalf of our uh, African American and black colleagues as we work for police reform and, and, and to advance the cause of Black Lives Matter. Many of those groups helped us get the rights that we have now secured, fragile as they may be. We have a responsibility to see immigration as a LGBTQ issue, to see police reform as being an LGBTQ issue. So uh, while there is still work to be done within our community, there's so much more that we must do to pay it forward, recognizing this rainbow wave was extremely diverse. It isn't just uh, queer people getting elected, it's women, it's trans people, it's people of color, it's the three of us that are here on this plenary session. Will you uh, just talk through some of the, the big high points of bills that California has passed the past year or two. I mean, some of these are really significant. I'm thinking about um, SB 132. Um, it, it, there's just some really big legislation that's come out of California that I feel like, uh, like you said, is a blueprint for the nation. Yeah, SB 132 is about allowing folks to who are incarcerated to go to the uh, prisons that align with their gender identity. Um, uh, it's about... Uh, uh, aligning uh, the criminal justice, uh, well, decriminalizing HIV uh, uh, is a, a different bill that we've done, is mentioning uh, a bill that we did not get done, but we need to do, and I believe will get done, around having a, a requirement that our teachers have cultural competency when it comes to dealing with LGBTQ youth, understanding, again, what I already knew internally when I was a boy, uh, that somehow it was different and therefore bad. If we can have teachers that know how to navigate that and help uh, our, our children when they're young, um, I think is a good thing. We have not got that done yet in California, but I believe that we will. Again, it's not the big banner issues. It may often be make a good uh, bumper sticker, but we know it's these little things that add up to inequities that really weigh us all down. Um, so uh, yeah, ch check out our, our caucus's web page. You can see that we're doing some cutting edge legislation. We do it knowing that it's helping our 40 million Californians, but we also know that when we do it, Nevada's next and Delaware's next and Georgia's next and uh, we're creating a pathway to the future that is more just and more equal. Um, yeah, and and it will be so interesting to see uh, what bills get introduced, not just in California, but in, in every state. Um, it's the coronavirus seems to have chilled some really uh, bad bills in the last year and, and some really good bills as well. So our, our eyes will be on all of your states going forward. Um, we have just a couple of minutes to wrap up. I'm curious, um, you know, we've talked about what you're looking forward to in the next year, but I'd like, you know, just any closing thoughts that you have for people who are considering running going into, um, you know, the next couple of years. Now that this is the dust has settled, um, you know, not just, you know, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, but also, um, you know, what are considerations when you are an out LGBTQ person and you're looking at doing this um, and your family, but also your community? Uh, what does it mean for, you know, the people that you represent that you think um, immediately to be able to take on this role? And, um, and, and what is the feedback that you've gotten from people now that, now that you've been elected to these historic positions? Uh, Senator Elect Jackson, do you want to start with this one? Sure. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm thinking, uh, particularly in my early when I was just first starting to to run for office, um, people you know say it takes it takes a whole community to be able to run, and uh, so I kind of made a, a short list of people that I thought were in my community. And what I discovered um, over time was that my community is so much bigger than I ever could have imagined. And that there are people, uh, and we've we've talked a lot about young people being influenced and caring about LGBTQ folks being elected, um, but we also just need to name there are a whole host of people who are not young, who are excited, who who didn't know that they would live to see this ever happen. 
happen. Um, and so I I want to to help people see and to know that the village of people who will support you is so much bigger than you can imagine. And that there is some, I mean, I had this experience, there's some 90-year-old little old lady who's sitting at home who's going to get a pamphlet about you, who's going to be excited about your election and want to support you. And so um, just make sure that you get prepared for that fact, that the, the village is bigger. Um, and then as a result of the village being bigger, we certainly do have a large responsibility to make sure that we represent that village and that we represent it well. Uh, I sit at the intersection of multiple identities. All those, you know, Todd was naming, you know, it's harder for women to run. It's harder for people of color to run. It's harder for LGBTQ folks to run. I'm all those things. <laughs> Um, and and and, it, and that's okay. It's still doable. Um, but what being, you know, I think Sarah talked about the superpower too. Because I sit at these intersections of multiple marginalized communities, um, my antenna for like searching out and seeing the ways that other people are being marginalized, it's very finely attuned. And so um, I'm looking forward to bringing that superpower to um, the Georgia State Legislature, and we need that all around this nation. We need people who know what it is to be left out. We need people who know what it is uh, to have your dreams dashed because you realize that, that you are who you are. We need those folks to be sitting in the seats of power so that we can remember and see and find those other communities that also feel that same way. That is our superpower, Sarah. And so I encourage folks, please, um, if you are, have any little inclination that you might wanna run, um, reach out and, and let's do this because the village is ready. Uh, the Rainbow Village, we're ready for you and we'll help support you. Thank you so much. Um, Mayor like Gloria, uh, what are your closing thoughts here for us? Uh, Kate, I know we're tight on time, so I, I will just say uh, ditto to everything uh, Senator-elect Jackson just said. Um, I, I would say not to listen to that voice in your head that so many of us have to tell us that we can't do it, uh, and look uh, at this grouping here and know that you can. Recognize that it's about doing the things your parents told you not to do. Knock on strangers' doors and raise, ask people for money. Uh, it's not glamorous, uh, but you know if you can overcome that, it'll go a long way. Have a basis support outside of the LGBTQ community. We are a great foundation to start with, but people got to see you as that housing guy or that uh, uh, um, uh, you know uh, transportation advocate. Um, and then lastly, I would say support the Victory Fund. Uh, the, this organization is transformational. And for those of us who have been involved in this for a long time, you remember when we didn't have very many of anybody elected anywhere, and now all across this country and all these communities that we thought were never even possible are now on the map. So support this organization that does such great work. Thank you. And Senator-elect um, McBride, I have very, very brief thoughts because I think Senator Jackson and, and, and Mayor Gloria just said it perfectly. And, and that is that the other barrier that I think so many of us face is our worry that politics is just so broken that public service is no longer worth it. Um, and that cynicism can take over because of what we see in the news. And I think what all of us represent, what Victory Fund represents, what our community represents, and what it shows is just the fundamental truth that change remains possible that we have it in our capacity to transform what once seemed so impossible that it was almost incomprehensible, not only into possibility, but into reality. And if we've done it before, that means we can do it again. Thank you all so much. Um, what a brilliant panel. Um, so delighted to join you all today. And I'm so looking forward to seeing what you all do over the next year and few years. And um, you know, keeping in touch with you. Um, of course, um, none of this would have been possible today without the support of our sponsors. And I'm gonna um, turn it over to one of them. Um, please um, welcome Facebook. Um, Khalid Pagan uh, is gonna join us right here in just a second. 
Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, and thanks for moderating the great panel. And thanks to all the panelists uh, for uh, really sharing your insights. Uh, my name is Khalid Pagan, as Kate mentioned, and I'm on Facebook's politics and government outreach team. Uh, Facebook is really thrilled again to be a sponsor of the Victory Institute, uh, to be a sponsor of this conference. Uh, we've been proud to partner with Victory over the past few years. This organization, as Mayor Gloria was saying, uh, really does the important work of preparing a group as large and, and as diverse as we all are uh, to serve as leaders. Um, want to give a big congratulations to all the candidates across the United States who uh, ran in last month's election. Uh, whether or not you won, it's really important, and you've done really important work of help making us more visible and helping making our community more visible. Uh, my team at Facebook is dedicated to helping candidates and elected officials across the globe use our entire family of products to connect um, with their communities and constituents. So we hope to connect with you all. Um, I'm specifically on our uh, US state and local team. So uh, I especially know how important it is uh, on the state and local level to have representation. So i uh, very happy to see all of you here and thrilled that, you know, state houses in Rhode Island and Maine, among others, will now be led by openly LGBTQ leaders. Um, so uh, we look forward to continuing our partnership with Victory um, and hope to connect with you all during the conference. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your, uh, enjoy the rest of your week.